for a signature service oil change and tire rotation today at Jiffy Lube. CBS Sports Radio is WJZ AM Baltimore, WJZ FM HD3, Catonsville, Baltimore, the flagship station for Maryland Terrapin women's basketball and Maryland Terrapin men's lacrosse. The opinions expressed in the following paid program do not necessarily represent those of WJZ AM 1300, CBS Radio, its employees and sponsors. This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Good evening. This is Wayne Viner. Bruce is away from the microphone. It's a great week in Turpland. Maryland beats Minnesota over the weekend. We have a heck of a show planned for you today. Brett Bissell, part of the radio crew, will be here. At 6.30, of course, you have Dennis from Coons Ford. At 6.40, Jeff Baxter, who played a lot of basketball with Lefty and Cole Fieldhouse. And then one of our young Terps joins in from the podcast group uh, before 7 o'clock. Mason, the intern, is joining me. Mason, how you doing tonight? Man, I thought I thought he forgot about me for a minute there, but it's a great night off a Terps win and a tough one coming up, but it's always an interesting game in Columbus. It will be. And Brett Bissell, welcome into Terp Talk this evening. Great to be with you guys again. Hey, well, it's great to have you. Uh, I want to ask about your trip out to Minnesota and what you felt from the fans there. Do you think they really expected to win? Uh, the Maryland fans or the Minnesota the fans? The Minnesota fans. <laughs> they, had, uh, some, they had some confidence coming off, you know, their, their start with undefeated season and all that. But, you know, if, if you look at the, at the film, you look at the stats, I mean, the teams they played, weren't exactly juggernauts. So I, I think the coaches that, that really broke down the film had a lot of confidence. The Maryland coaches had a lot of confidence that, that you know, this is a team that they could beat, you know, based on, on what they saw. And one thing that you probably don't know is, I mean, the weekend started off kind of rough. The plane was delayed over three hours, which kind of, you know, when, when you're a coach, you, you time everything down to the last second. And that just threw everything in a tizzy, but they obviously didn't were no worse for wear on that because it worked out well for them. So what day of the week was that? That was Friday. Usually uh, the plane leaves around 2.15, 2.30, but uh, we got a text about 11.30 saying, hey, the plane's uh, broken, you know, stand by. And then we got a text, okay, it looks like we're going to be leaving around 3. And then we got another text, you know, Get there, or get there by 4.15. We hope to leave by 5.30 when they finally did. I think they had to get a new plane. So basically, you know, the team, when they usually get into town, they have meetings, they have dinner. But this case, you know, we didn't get to the hotel till 8 o'clock at night. So that just was three hours that they had to kind of go on the fly and make things up, you know, because they had to scrap their regular game plan in terms of the meetings and the dinners and everything like that. But, you know, by the time, you know, there was an hour difference, so... 8 o'clock their time, 9 o'clock Eastern time, and the game was at 11 a.m. the next day. So there wasn't a whole lot of room to do, and it's a lot of time to do anything but, uh, you know, go to your room and sleep. Well, <laughs> I guess some, sometimes that's the way it goes. Did Tom drive the equipment out, Tom Marquito, the engineer? Did he, he fly did out? not drive to that. He has, a, he has usually about an 8 to 10 hour uh, window where if it's less than that, he'll drive. Like he's driving to Columbus again, but. What he normally does is he flies out with the team, and then he can't break down the equipment quick enough. So usually he'll just spend the night and fly home commercial the next day. So we kind of leave him in the alert saying, sorry, you got to roll your own wire because we're out of here. We don't want to miss the bus. All right, Mason, what do you have? Well, Brett, you had a good weekend the weekend of the UCF game. Can you tell us a little bit about your NFL day on Sunday? Oh, yeah, that was a crazy long day. I, uh, I stupidly booked myself two NFL games to work. First one was in Philadelphia. One, the Giants took on the Eagles, and that was the one. And I figured, well, you know, it's a three-hour game. I can I can get back to D.C. because I was asked the, the Raiders Ravens game, uh, Raiders Redskin game, uh, Sunday night, and that started at eight thirty. So I figured, you know, I if I can get out of there by four thirty, you know, allow for three hours, you know, two and a half to three hours, I can get there in plenty of time. But as I don't know if you remember, the game went down to the wire, ordering on overtime till the rookie kicker for the Eagles kicked a 61 yarder at the last play of the game. And if that hadn't, uh, if that had gone into overtime, I got to been in big trouble. So I raced out of there. And the funny thing was when I got there at 10:30 in the morning, I, you know, asked a bunch of policemen and, 
uh, parking lot attendants, what's the easiest access to get out of the stadium so I wouldn't get stuck in traffic. It would be really bad there. So they all told me this one gate, so I parked right next to that gate so I could have easy access. Of course, when I came down at the end of the game, that gate was locked, so I had to kind of – I had to kind of right. change things right then and there. But the, the best thing that happened was since everybody, you know, stayed to the last second, I, uh, you know, it was almost like rush hour hadn't started yet. So I was able to get right out of there. Well, I've been I up got there. On 95. I've been up What's there that? that press box, and they have that oh, express yeah. elevator yeah. down, and you're right out yeah. the door. Exactly. So what time did the Eagles game end, and what time did you get on it the road? It ended, uh, I got to my house, I, mean, I got to my car about 4.45, so. It was like 45 minutes longer than I thought it would be, the game, you know, just because there were so many stoppages of play for injuries and, and, you know, reviews of play. So I figured, well, if I can get here, you know, I, I knew without traffic it would be a little over two hours, but I knew I was going to get hammered because it's Sunday afternoon on, on 95. So I, uh, I took a shot, rolled the dice, got out of there quickly, did get in some terrible traffic in Delaware and the northern Maryland. What happened, what actually did help me, which I didn't even think about, was when I got close to FedEx Field, most yep. of the tailgaters were already in the stadium. So, right, that was you know, a I late get, game for uh, the yeah, Redskins. So, exactly. Mason so has a, that helped a lot. Mason has a question about how all this works. In terms of, go ahead, Mason. In terms of, um, well, you always are watching the game with a different eye than most of the people. Right. I've asked you this one before, but it's always, mm-hmm. it's always different as seasons progress. Right. And you have to look at every play the same way. Absolutely. Every play, it starts again for me. So I'm, I'm looking for, for trends. I'm looking for things that happen. You know, if, if somebody, uh, you know, catches the ball, how many yards is he getting after the catch? You know, what plays are working, what isn't? I mean, how many times are getting sacked? And at the same time, I'm also looking for certain things that might happen, like in that red, red skin game. I remember reading if Michael Crabtree caught a pass, It'd be his 115th straight game, so I had a little piece of paper ready to give to the announcer at that point. And actually, he didn't even get it until midway through the third quarter, so I thought that paper was going to go away from the streak was going to end, but he ended up did, did get it. Did so get you just warning. try to do any, well, yeah, you just try to do anything you can to make the uh, announcers look good and, and sound like you know that they're right involved and they they know that everything that's going on in the game. That's kind of what I did. Right. It was fun. And who called? A long the, day, but it was fun. <laughs> who called the Redskins game and also the Eagles game? Uh, the Eagles game was a new new play-by-play announcer. It was actually his first NFL game, so the way to start for him, his name is Josh Appel. He used to be uh, the Florida International play-by-play guy, and he, you know he's getting a shot at the at the national level, wow, national that, radio for Sports USA. Yeah, that's was, a step like, up there. Yeah, he was he was pretty nervous, but boy, he, you know, I told him after the game as I ran, as I ran out the uh, out the um, door that. Uh, you know, don't get used to this. You'll never have another game this good. You know, <laughs> so your first one. So I, I worked with him, and then legendary coach uh, uh, John Robinson, the old uh, Rams coach, in that game. And then when I rushed down to the Redskin game, I worked with uh, one of my favorites, Kevin Kugler, who's one of the Big Ten top announcers, and he does the Sunday night game for Westwood One every Sunday night. And his new partner this year was new, new uh, current. I mean, new Hall of Famer jo- um, Jason Taylor, right? Who played with the Redskins for a, for a little bit, but mainly he was right. a Dolphin. He was, and I, th- I think he might have been the. T- I think I was trying to calculate. He might have been the twelfth Hall of Fame NFL player or coach that I've worked with. So right. that was kind of cool. Well, yeah, he had, and I you got get, to add to that list. Well, you get to work with the legendary Johnny Holiday and Tim Strack, and how much? Study, Nobody better. Nobody better. How much study do you do to prep to call a Maryland game? And does it matter who they play? Um, it really doesn't matter who they play. You, you you go through the press notes. You see, once again, things that may happen. You know, D.J. Morris caught a pass in 25 straight games. Johnny usually has that, but I have it just in case as a backup. You know, if, if someone like Ty Johnson gets a long, you know, like the, the winning touchdown he had was 34 yards, which was great. But, you know, I had a stat ready that, you know, he's had X amount of plays over 40 yards over the last two years. So that one didn't quite qualify, but I had it ready just in case. Right. When he but touches with Johnny, the ball. Johnny, it's easy. Yeah. yeah, you'd never know what's going to happen. No, you have to keep that list of Maryland stats as the last time this happened. <laughs> exactly with Ty right. Johnson, he's explosive. But this weekend, we go up against an absolute legendary coach, whether you like him or not. He is the only coach 
that has four win streaks of 20 games or more. He did it at Florida, Ohio State Crazy. at 25 games. Uh, I guess the streak ended recently as they yep, lost against Oklahoma. To, yeah, and the, the planting of the flag has been a topic around here. Uh, <laughs> it's been a nice topic. I like that. It time. has. I, I actually didn't blame Baker Mayfield for that. Mason, Heck a no. little more old school. What do you think? Right. Mason's old school? Yeah, Mason's old school. <laughs> That doesn't make sense. We I know. I know it doesn't. <laughs> but we're up against Ohio State and Dobbins, a tailback. How many yards did you say he had more than, uh, more than Ty Johnson? Yeah, Lou Dobbins comes in around the 550 mark in yards. It's going well, to be an I interesting mean, one. I mean, he has more yards, but let's face it, he doesn't. They don't have a a two, three headed monster like like uh, Maryland does right now. You know, that where the, where the carries are being, you know, shifted around from to two or three different players. So. But, I mean, don't get me wrong, the kid's an amazing player. He um, is, and every time you turn on the TV, you hear how Jason uh, now Barrett isn't playing that well, and you look up, and he's one of the greatest passers of all time in yeah, the Big yeah, Ten yeah. and the record yeah. holder for Ohio yeah. State. And he seems, he does the running, he does the passing, he's going to be a hard guy to contain, maybe a little right. bit like uh, Mackenzie Milton for UCF. You think With a lot more experience. A yeah. lot more experience, but, you know, the Kid from UCF looked like a magician with the ball. And you know what? Everybody was all distraught and jumping off the ledge after that game. But, I mean, look, look what they did last week to Memphis. You know, Memphis. I mean, they, they they rolled them big time. Now they're ranked in the top 25. So that loss isn't looking as bad as, you know, we originally oh, no. thought. So. The UCF defense has some guys that are going to play in the NFL. And I oh, think UCF is going to go yeah, undefeated. Ball, yeah. I think you're going to see uh, them in a big ball. And yeah, then it will look so definitely bad. could. And then, then Scott Frost will leave for Nebraska, and then we'll have to start over again probably. So, okay, you know. I wasn't going there, but that's <laughs> another good topic of debate because Mason's yeah. always been a Nebraska fan. Of course, he's a Terp, but he likes Nebraska right. a little bit. And he says they aren't no. going to hire him because they want a Nebraska run game. And, and Scott Frost is all about going fast. Mason, talk about that yeah. for a second. Yes, yeah, Scott Frost, as Maryland got to see the unfortunate side of that offense a few Saturdays mm-hmm. ago. But as I've been hearing out of the Nebraska camp, they want a guy that's going to line up in the I formation and run the ball straight, and that's obviously not what Scott Frost gets to do. But, Brett, you get to see a lot of these games. Is there still a place for the old I form running the ball up the middle? Um, I think at times I don't think you I think you can't just focus on that because, because the defenses are so much faster and they can stack the box and stuff like that. But I, I think with the right personnel and you get some big, big, big ten linemen, sure, that could definitely work. I mean, but, uh, you know, I don't buy this that they don't want Scott Frost. They want to win. Simple as that. They don't care how they do it. They want to win. And and what Scott Frost has done so far is, is you know, nothing sort of short of miraculous in, in the little bit of time he's been a head coach. And and they'd be foolish to not, you know, go after an alumni like him who's, who's become a proven winner. You know, and he bleeds, he bleeds uh, Nebraska red. So, I mean, uh, I'd be shocked. I mean, he may not want to leave Central Florida for Nebraska, but, uh, you know, if I was him, I think, I think he'd go back to the alma mater. That's just what I think. So, yeah, it's you know. a it's a bit cold and windy out there. When we went out for the game last year, we turned a corner around that stadium, and I almost got blown over. Ooh, yeah, it's uh, it's rough. But I'll be honest with you, I, I do games all over the country, and, and that, that stadium ranks in top five for me, maybe even top three. It's just an amazing place to see a game, to do a game. The fact that they've had sellouts for you know fifty some years straight is just it's uh, it's 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 really fun to be out there to really absorb college football on a Saturday there it's 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 a pretty special place no doubt about it and that's another reason why you you know, you'd want to coach the facilities are as good as any in the country I don't know if you saw but they have this unbelievable dining room like below yeah. the, below yeah. the stadium I mean <laughs> we were there my line from yeah, going out there and I. My line from going out there, and I told this uh-huh. uh, to Tim in the airport on the way home, we're about a uh-huh. billion dollars behind them oh, overall, absolutely. especially with I prices mean, around here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, but you're not gonna you're not gonna get. I mean, they get they get their share of Southern players, but you're not you're gonna get. A, they're recruiting a different type of athlete than, than we are, and uh, you know they're looking for the big bruisers, and that's why once again, you know, the power I may work there, but but. They 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 would adjust their offense to whatever will, will get them W's, and that that's the bottom line. I think, you know, I mean, I I don't, I mean, I I think they definitely want to win, and if, if Scott Frost is the man that could do it, then that's that's who they'll get. I think. I mean, you're talking also about a program that sells out every volleyball game that ever existed. It's and, just and believe it or not, and right, and believe it or not, their basketball, yeah, their basketball atmosphere 
I mean, I wouldn't say it ranks up there with Indiana and Duke, but it, it's pretty darn close. I mean, they really get after it there. Yeah, it's Tim a fun, Miles, fun atmosphere. Tim Miles is on the hot seat a bit. they got to win in basketball. Yep. But this work somehow got sidetracked. All my fault okay. on Nebraska. Sorry. You, okay. are, you are listening to Coons Ford Terp Talk here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio, WJZ AM in Baltimore. This Wednesday and every Wednesday at 6 o'clock, Brett Bissell from the Terp Radio crew on football is joining us. I'm Wayne Viner. That is based the intern. Bruce is away from the microphone. So I want to focus in on Maryland a little bit as okay. we're getting up to the break here. Sure. I was really impressed with the way Walt Bell set up the offense for Bortenschlager, especially the five wide look, which I think allowed him to identify where he was going to go to the ball before the play started, and those reads proved accurate. Is that how it looked to you? Yeah, I, I think I think when uh... – Kasim went out early in the game. It kind of threw everybody, including the coaches, for a loop because, I mean, they, they had planned on, you know, on the game plan that was going to work best for Kasim, and they threw Max in, obviously a different type of player, and, you know, everybody thought, well, you know, Max is no good. He, he can't run this offense, but given a week to prepare, Walt Bell and his staff changed things up, you know, more to his strength. I mean, in my opinion, Max doesn't have to be a superstar. He just has to to throw the ball good enough to take the pressure off the running game. Otherwise, teams are going to stack stack the line and stop the running game. That's exactly what UCF did. But, you know, he makes those throws. He made some amazing throws. That throw to D.J. Moore for a touchdown, I mean, that's as good as you can get. He had a couple really good throws. And that's all he has to do. He has to manage the game. And, and that's exactly what he did at Minnesota. You know, the offensive line played as good as they have, all, you know, as long as I can remember. I mean, keeping the pressure off them. Didn't get sacked at all, whereas against UCF, he got sacked a bunch. And it, it, it made that Ty Johnson and Lolo could, could do their thing. And, you know, Minnesota didn't know how to, how to stop, you know, one or the other. So that, and that's, that was important. It was all Walt Bell right there. Yeah, you see a team that, well, when Max was out there, there were some tip balls that have to be of concern for this team. And when you go out against an Ohio State that just has ridiculous athletes and talent all across the board, yeah you got to yep. worry about some of those tip passes that Max had on Saturday. Yeah, it definitely is a worry, but I think, once again, it's a timing issue. He had a week a week of getting reps as the first team. Now he's had another week of getting reps. I mean, he's got to find his gaps, his seams, and, and step away. He's obviously not as big as Kasim, and it's definitely, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, we're all still, loving this Minnesota win, but it's not going to be the same this, this week. We all know that. No. Because, I mean, you want to be in the game, and I athlete. think – I think we can close this segment. One thing, I talked to Max, and that video is up on TerpTalk.com, along with DJ's press conference and a chat. He had a lot with... of fans there, by the way, from Indiana, which was great to see. Say again? He had a lot of fans uh, supporting him from Indiana that drove yep. up, which was great to see. And they can make the trip to Ohio State this week Absolutely. as well. He he has the look of a quarterback, and he sort of sounds like a Midwestern quarterback. He sounds very yep. self-assured for only being – that was his first – a second start. One was Absolutely. at Nebraska. Exactly. At Nebraska, week. which is you know, going right to the fire there, too, as we right. just talked about. Yeah, I mean, that's you need that your quarterback. You need that quiet confidence. You need him to be borderline cocky. And, you know, the, the rest of the team has to feed off that. And it sure looked like they did to me, um, you know, this week you know, out of Minnesota, for sure. All right, Brett, I thank you for joining us, and especially for the interview you did with Mason that's also on TerpTalk.com earlier awesome. in the year. We will Wait, see Mason's you. Mason's a budding star. We all know that. Oh, yes, we do. We will see you <laughs> in College Park for the Northwestern game. Sounds great. Always good to see you. talk to you guys. All right, thanks for being on. Right. Hey, guys, stick around. Dennis Kulatsis from Coons Ford is up next after these commercials. 